Hello, it's great to be with you and uh, thank you very much. And I am going to be presenting on Annex 1 and some of the changes to environmental monitoring that are impacting on the, the Annex and the way that we conduct and control clean rooms. So I'll just share my screen. Okay, brilliant. So I'm, I'm, I'm Tim Sandal, and it's a pleasure to be with you. And for the next um, half an hour, we're going to be looking at the kind of broad changes that Annex 1 is heralding in the world of environmental monitoring. Before we begin, I think it's really important to establish what environmental monitoring is and what we mean by, um, by monitoring. Um, the first thing is that it's not a substitute for poor environmental control. We have to ensure that we've introduced quality by design and risk assessment into our operational and clean room designs. Get that correct. And then when we've assessed our risks, controlled them adequately, and reduce them down to an acceptable level, then it's appropriate to consider where do we want to monitor. Environmental monitoring is also ineffective if it's been poorly designed. It's also something that's not fully outlined in any standard or compendia, so there's always going to be a, a degree of interpretation, and this is why a microbiologist is needed to, to lead the development of the program. It's also unlikely to be exactly the same in each facility. There are some general principles, but um, there's always going to be local variation. So environmental monitoring needs to be part of the wider biocontamination control or, or the overarching contamination control strategy, which is something that's really important. Uh, within Annex 1, and which appears um, multiple times, and there, there's some presentations uh, we're also looking at that. Uh, environmental monitoring needs to be well thought out, well designed, based on scientific principles. It needs to be risk-based, connecting with the wider quality risk management system. We have to make sure it's documented in terms of having a policy and a rationale, a procedure on how to execute, and then the various documentation to capture and to trend analysis. Um, there also needs to be a consideration of the core hazards and the underlying principles of Annex 1, which are to protect products from the main contamination sources, and the fundamental contamination source is from people. So we need good design principles to support that through material control, effective cleaning and disinfection, and seeing environmental monitoring as a holistic concept. So what happens in lower grade clean rooms could well affect what's going on in higher grade areas. It's very easy to have a control breakdown and for contamination transfer to take place. In terms of the purpose of environmental monitoring, then we're seeking to get meaningful information about the quality of the environments in which we're preparing medicines in. We also want to have a sensitive system and one with an appropriate alert level that can help signal control breakdown before it becomes too disastrous and allow us to react to that information. It needs to be able to uh, give us a degree of assurance that when we're preparing sterile medicines that um, we have sufficient data which to be able to make uh, release decisions and it can also signal to a degree how good our environmental controls are how well our clean rooms are working and the extent that we can um, achieve good cleaning and disinfection the level of cleanliness in our environments and all of these key principles are embedded in the annex one revision. So an effective environmental monitoring program will help us to demonstrate good environmental quality. It'll give us a timely and sensitive warning system and allow us to take action in good time. 
Now, in terms of some of the key changes in relation to um, Annex 1, then we're getting a signal that we need a more nuanced environmental monitoring program, one that's going to react to key events and not simply be formalistic or doing the same thing over and over again. So we might need to increase frequencies or look for alternative locations when we have greater points of risk. So this could be coming out of a shutdown. Uh, often we want a higher level of environmental monitoring to assess the impact of any works upon the clean room environments. We also want to understand how effective our cleaning and disinfection is. So we're going to be um, undertaking monitoring prior to cleaning to assess what's the worst point, and then post cleaning and disinfection to assess how effective that has been. If we're making changes like um, increasing the number of operators allowed in an area or introducing a new shift pattern, we also want to have a perhaps a greater level of understanding about that environmental impact. And similarly with new equipment and also following engineering works and, and, and Annex 1 calls out um, the need to pay attention to um, the impact of works of maintenance on facilities, particularly when they're in the operational state. Also in Annex 1, we have, particularly with where grade A data is expressed, the change from less than one CFU, CFU being colony forming unit, to the statement saying no growth. And this not only shows a tightening of the expectations as far as Annex 1 is concerned, it also signals that alternative methods can be used, ones that don't necessarily use the colony forming unit as a way of expressing um, data. We also um, get the importance of trending. So we need to trend microbial counts, but also the types of organisms and to study the patterns of the types of species that are recovered from clean rooms. So we can get an idea of whether resistance is occurring. And we also need to be more cognizant of the alert level as well and look for subtle changes there to see whether that's signaling any significant changes in data, particularly where we're getting consecutive alert levels or strange patterns of data. And of course, we need to do full in-depth analyses of where we get action level excursions as well. And I'll dive into some of that in a little bit more detail as we progress with this presentation. It's also important that the environmental monitoring program understands the contamination sources and allows us to develop a meaningful monitoring program based on the different hazards and the risks that they represent. So we have people as a primary risk and also water. Now water is a vector. Um, it's very easy to spread contamination through aerosol to aerosols. And also water provides a growth source for a number of organisms, particularly gram negatives. Then we have secondary sources. So contamination is going to be in the air and that can settle out or be misdirected in the wrong way. Surfaces, unless they've recently been cleaned and disinfected, could well be contaminated. And it's quite easy to transfer from one surface to another, a level of contamination. And also equipment can produce contamination, particularly particulates. And with all of these sources, we are seeking to protect the product. It's, we're trying to avoid risk of microbial ingress into the product. So in terms of um, what we want to monitor uh, with the environmental monitoring program, um, we're going to need to monitor air. So air, particularly in uh, turbulent flow areas, uh, can be a, a way of spreading contamination. But also in grade A in unidirectional airflow, then we can also break first air if we carry out interventions through glove ports, for example. 
It's also possible for contamination to settle out into surfaces, as we've, as we've discussed, and um, we're not always um, great with our cleaning and disinfection, so we need to be conscious that a given surface could be contaminated. And then, of course, the variations around people anyway in terms of behaviours is, is always going to be something that we need to be concerned about. So in terms of um, how we monitor, um, there are the established classic methods, and these are again uh, described again in the annex, but there are some subtleties and some issues around the um, accuracy of these methods that, that the annex mentions and, and they're worth spelling. But we also have rapid microbiological methods as well, which are available. And some of these are becoming increasingly robust and, and suitable for clean room use. So we need to consider rapid methods in addition to the classic methods or even as a, eventually as a whole scale replacement. Um, so let's just consider some of the uh, key issues to do with the classic methods. So the first thing is active air samplers. Now, the first thing is not all active air samplers are the same. They work in different ways. There's a big difference between those that work by filtration or impaction or centrifugal forces, for example. But also, all air samples differ in their level of accuracy. So air samplers have a biological collection efficiency. And they also have a physical collection efficiency. And the physical collection efficiency is expressed by the D50 value. And the D50 value is the smallest size of particle, at which point we can be confident of picking up 50% of the contamination that enters the air sample. So as a general rule, the smaller the particle for the D50 value, the more accurate our air sampler will be. So we generally want to be specifying air samplers of say one or two microns at D50. They're, they're gonna give us uh, more reliable recoveries, particularly where we're looking for low level contamination as we might do in grade A environments. We also need to be mindful of, of agar dehydration. I'll come to that a bit more in settled plates in a second. Uh, we also need to make sure that our air sampler is not gonna disrupt the airstream and it's not going to be pumping out particles. Now, saddle plates, a very useful form of environmental monitoring when thought is given to their appropriate location. So we need to understand airflow visualization and airflow visualization is given a big place in that's described in a lot more detail. And looking at those air patterns can help us to determine where the most appropriate locations for our saddle plates. Um, we also need to be mindful of the risk of agar desiccation. And the annex makes reference to this. So we need to make sure that our plate can be exposed for um, four hours without losing any of its agar structure and also still been able to recover uh, viable microorganisms. And if we find that plates are cracking, well, one, that's a data integrity issue, but two, it means that we need to work with our media suppliers and improve the robustness of our plates, such as having a deeper agar fill, for example. Contact plates um, are generally effective. We need to be careful that they because they leave agar residue, so we need to disinfect afterwards. But perhaps the most important consideration with the contact plate is the need for them to contain a disinfectant neutralizer, because there probably will be residues, even if we're using low residue cleaning and disinfectant products on surfaces. We can also get devices that can help us to standardize the time and pressure, and they all help to make the uh, act of contact plate sampling more consistent. Swabs, um, there are obviously some issues around with swab recovery, but um, data shows um, that flock swabs give a far better recovery than plain swabs. And with flock swabs, we can get recoveries equivalent to, or sometimes even better than we can achieve with the contact plate. With particle counters, um, we need to 
make sure that um, particle counters are in meaningful locations. You need to know what Annex 1 says about the potential to need to add additional locations, particularly not being over-reliant necessarily on classification data, but with introducing risk-based um, thinking as well. So it's going beyond the classification, particularly for ongoing monitoring. There's also some other things that are, that are quite important to do with particle counters, and many of these are referenced in the annex as well. But we need to make sure that our particle counter is being calibrated against an internationally recognized standard. So the annex says we need to follow ISO 14644 for clean room classification. And within ISO 14644, it directs us to ISO 21501 for our particle counter color, uh, qualifications and calibrations. We also need to make sure that when we're monitoring in unidirectional airflows that we're using isokinetic probes and that the probes are orientated in the direction of the airflow. We also need to control the tubing as well. So particle counting tubing should not be any longer than one meter. If it does have to have a bend in it, any bend should be minimized and should there should not be any kinking. A good standard rule is to make sure that any bends in the counter are at least greater than 15 centimeters, but really we want to try and avoid any bends at all and make sure we've appropriately risk assessed that as well. And also, uh, when we're situation particle counters, we need to be conscious of anything that might give us a false uh, positive result, like spraying glove spray too close to the counter. Now, rapid microbiological methods, uh, there's a number um, coming onto the market. We have um, ways of um, getting early detection for agar plates using techniques like blue light excitation. We also have ATP swabs, and we have the newer generation of particle counters, so what's called spectrophotometric or biofluorescent counters. And these use advances in uh, optics, and they have um, several bio sensors within them that can pick up different um, potential elements of microbial cells. So they differentiate between inert particles and biologic particles. And these, this could be a very powerful tool. So at grade A or at grade B, C interfaces, assessing numbers of people in changing rooms and other applications. So there's a quite an exciting rapid wave of technology that's coming through and Annex 1 actively encourages that. Um, there's also mention in Annex 1 for us to adopt a sort of more uh, nuanced and detailed approach to the environmental monitoring program. So we need to understand how often we're going to monitor. Now, for sterile manufacturing, that's fairly uh, well laid down. We have to do continuous monitoring, and we're directed to make sure that begins with startup and goes all the way to the end of the process. But for other clean rooms, we may have grade B support rooms, grade C, grade D areas, then we need to adopt risk-based thinking to determine how often we should monitor given clean room. So we need to understand what's going on in rooms, how many people are there, length of activities, whether there's open product, room temperatures, different manufacturing stages, whether there are water sources, and we can put all that together in a risk framework and use risk filtering, which can help us to determine appropriate frequencies. We also need to weigh up um, how we're going to try and capture wor worst case. Uh, Annex 1, again, requires us to specify the maximum numbers of people in a room. So we need to make sure that our monitoring is reflective of those worst case conditions. So time of monitoring is another factor. Again, with sterile products manufacturing, then um, we need to sure, ensure that we're capturing all of the key stages, set up any hold periods, filling periods, loading of lawfulizers, and um, the kind of clean down procedures as well. 
Um, we need to make sure that uh, grade A and grade B monitoring are continuous. And with um, grade C and D areas, then we need to make sure that they're representative and that we're capturing a meaningful period of information so that we have the greatest confidence that those clean rooms can meet the um, maximum conditions to which they're subjected to. Locations for monitoring. Now, this is a clear area where we need to introduce risk-based thinking. So we need to go back to consider those contamination sources that we looked at earlier and consider how those hazards might be expressed as risks and present a challenge to our pharmaceutical products. So we need to look at things like where is personal activity the greatest? Where could surface to surface or person to surface to product transfer happen? Where air transfer can happen or where there could be a, a water risk? We need to understand our environmental monitoring um, histories and in particular we need to understand the flows of people and materials in and people and waste out of a given area. So there are different risk assessment tools we can look at. We can again cross-refer through the annex to ICHQ9. My personal preference is to use HACCP. So HACCP is Hazard Analysis Critical Control Points. And this is a uh, risk tool that allows us to map processes and look for potential concerns to try and reduce those risks and then monitor. Um, appropriately using the appropriate methodology. So here's an example of a imaginary clean room where we've got uh, green arrows for people in and red arrows for people out. And with this, we can then uh, carry out a, a detailed hazard analysis and put in our locations for monitoring. So this just happens to be an overlay example data with um, some air monitoring so we have sp for subtle plate and as for active air sampler it's just an example of the kind of risk-based approaches and thinking that we need to do we also need to consider culture media as well and here the annex doesn't really give a big steer apart from that the media should be able to recover a wide range of microorganisms of the type expected within the clean room um, but also we need to consider whether we use one or two culture medium and if we use one culture medium what the appropriate incubation time and temperature should be. My own personal studies in this area have shown that TSA can recover bacteria and fungi very well but the order of incubation should be with a lower temperature 20 to 25 degrees Celsius moving to a higher temperature 30 to 35 degrees Celsius and that the incubation regime should be at least five days. But that's on my own research. Um, the key thing is to consider it and to develop something appropriate. With alert and action levels, then uh, the Annex puts a great emphasis upon setting an appropriate and sensitive alert level so that we can draw meaningful data trends from that. And data trending is really important. Environmental monitoring is only really of any value if it is trended. So we need to develop graphs and histograms. So for example, trend chart on the slide, and you can see a worsening situation. So something's happening, which would require the facility to investigate. And having those kind of trend charts allows us to overlay meaningful information such as is it particular locations, particular dates, time, shift changes? Have we fundamentally altered our clean room design? Has something happened that could um, account for the data shift that we've seen? And if we stretch it over a long enough period of time, we can also introduce things like seasonality as well. Carrying out investigations into microbial excursions is also featured in the annex. Uh, I believe that having a separate SOP, one distinct from a chemistry procedure, is really important. 
and the SOP should structure the microbial investigation, describe the different steps involved, and make sure that there's um, a place to consider root cause, a place to consider risk, and an area where we can develop and formulate appropriate corrective and preventative actions. Now, setting uh, CAPA is, is again a really important feature of an environmental monitoring program. And again, it's a requirement within the, the annex that we're doing something about environmental excursions. So we may be able to look at things. So I just throwing some examples on the slide here. So there could have been uh, maintenance with a uh, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning system. There may be a new disinfectant that's come in. Uh, there may have been temperature or humidity excursions. We may have had a new shift coming on. So there's various reasons that we need to consider um, about why things have happened and how we might correct and set meaningful CAPA that actually leads to a reduction in events. Now, I mentioned earlier that uh, part of the trending and part of the overall consideration was the identification of microorganisms. So we need to understand what the microbial types within the facility, because changes in the norm can signal problems with cleaning and disinfection. If we're suddenly seeing organisms that are resistant to standard disinfectants might indicate that we need to vary how often we apply a sporicide. And can also get information about potential causes or origins of contamination by grouping organisms into different categories. So we might find a predominance of organisms that come from humans. And if they happen to be organisms that were associated with the nose and mouth, like streptococci, then they might signal to us that we've had a, we know we've got poor mask control or something similar. And we can also use the most common types of organisms profiled to challenge our culture media, to carry out disinfectant efficacy testing as well. So there's a lot of uh, meaning and key data we can draw. So it's not just about the numbers of organisms. It's not always just about the frequency or the gaps in the events. It's also about the species and what they might be telling us. And if we're involved with non-sterile processing, then we'll be particularly focused on objectionable organisms, which might present a particular harm to specific product types. But also, even if we're doing sterile manufacturing, and although we shouldn't find organisms, there still might be certain types of organisms that are so strange or come from sources that really signal really bad control breakdowns like fungi that, um, again, we may want to react to with a different uh, degree of concern and uh, overall awareness. OK, so it's important that people who are carrying out environmental monitoring are appropriately trained, so a good, robust training system. And again, training features quite importantly within the annex. Data integrity is, is also important. And data integrity applies to environmental monitoring, whether that information, the data is computerized or not. Because if we go back to our settle plates, we spoke about desiccation, we're getting cracked plates, that's a loss of data. We also need to understand that people can read plates correctly, they have an appropriate light source, they've got appropriate magnification, and they can understand uh, what, what different colonies close to each other might look like, or uh, if they have spreading colonies and things like that. So there are some key factors there. And then also data integrity extends to our uh, automated equipment as well. So we have uh, controls we need to have around particle counters, for example, uh, definitions of, of true data, backing up data, suitable passwords, and, and, and so on. So there's a raft of equipment-related data integrity things as well. Okay, so I think that's my uh, allotted time um, coming up. So uh, what I've attempted to do is to distill the key aspects of EU GMP Annex 1 um, and to uh, explore those in, in this presentation for environmental monitoring.
So the key changes about uh, nudge to adopt rapid methods, the limitations with the convention methods, and the need to think about things holistically, to think about things in terms of risk, to understand how contamination interacts, that there are different origins, different sources of contamination, but there are equally different vectors that can spread that contamination around, and that the monitoring program needs to be finely tuned to adapt to that. And then also where the annex uh, tells us to be mindful of changes as well that might lead us to perhaps update our locations or to increase our frequencies. And we used the example, let's say, coming out of a shutdown, um, which can sometimes lead to spikes in contamination. And there's going to be other, other reasons as well. So all of that's important, as is data trending and as is having a defined environmental monitoring program. So it's a program that needs to be documented and also regularly reviewed. None of these things should be procedures that simply sit on shelves. Uh, th these are supposed to be living, breathing, dynamic documents. OK, so thank you for your attention with this presentation. I'm Dr. Tim Sandal. And this was environmental monitoring in relation to um, EU GMP Annex 1. And um, happy to move over to uh, any questions that you might have. And, uh, thank you very much for your attention so far.